Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, a new species of supergiant deep sea creature has been discovered, Hubble takes hundreds of pictures of the Andromeda galaxy, and a new kind of predatory dinosaur has been named. Our top story this week is the fantastic discovery of a new species of supergiant deep sea creature. It's a species of isopod, a very large grouping of crustaceans that also includes the land living woodlice, and it's been named Bathynomus vaderi. Yes, that's right, it's been named after Darth Vader, as the scientists apparently noticed a resemblance between the Sith Lord's iconic helmet and the head of this new species. The new species was actually discovered by researchers in a seafood market in Vietnam, and the paper explains how deep sea isopods have become increasingly popular as a delicacy in Vietnam in recent years, with fishermen obtaining these animals from the South China Sea. Bathynomus vaderi is considered a supergiant, as it's particularly large for an isopod, achieving 12.8 inches in length and weighing more than a kilogram or 2.2 pounds. It's the second supergiant isopod from the South China Sea, as Bathynomus jamesi, described in 2017, can also grow pretty massive. These isopods are scavenging creatures that scuttle about on the seafloor, feeding on the carcasses of other marine animals that sink down to the deep sea, and hence play a vital part in the ecology of this fascinating environment. It's pretty amazing that a species this big has managed to stay hidden from science for this long, and shows just how much more there is to discover about the deep waters of Southeast Asia. As the researchers state, there is an urgent need to better understand our deep sea biodiversity as humans increasingly endeavour to exploit this habitat for fisheries, oil and gas, and even minerals. The sustainable fishery of giant isopods just adds to the many challenges we face, and the first step is to know what lives there. In other news this week, the findings from an extensive survey of the Andromeda Galaxy by the Hubble Telescope have been released in a paper published in the Astrophysical Journal. The Andromeda Galaxy is our closest galactic neighbour, and is estimated to be home to a trillion stars. However, many of them are too far away for us to be able to see, the Hubble telescope only being able to pick up the light of 200 million stars. Hubble was only able to pick up stars that were brighter than our own sun, and while 200 million isn't quite 1 trillion, the orbital telescope still collected a massive dataset and will be a brilliant resource for anyone wanting to study our next door neighbour. This was a particularly difficult task because of how close, and therefore how large, the galaxy is to the Hubble telescope, so it was quite the task to image the whole thing. The process took 10 whole years, as Hubble had to be in just the right position to take each of the 600 photos needed for this giant collage, requiring over a thousand orbits from the telescope. Hubble's data is set to be increased by both the James Webb Space Telescope and the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, which will both add to Hubble's incredible efforts to create an ever more detailed map of the Andromeda Galaxy. We'd also like to quickly cover a couple of rocket launches from this week. Most recently, SpaceX's Starship had another test, which saw the company catch the massive first stage booster in their so-called chopstick arms as part of their quest for reusability. Other parts of the test were, unfortunately, more of a failure, as the team lost contact with the upper stage of Starship eight and a half minutes into launch. It is thought that the issue stemmed from an oxygen and or fuel leak. Earlier on in the week, Blue Origin launched their new Glenn rocket in a first orbital test, and the orbit part of the test was a success. New Glenn, like SpaceX's Falcon 9 rockets, are intended to be reusable, but unfortunately, the lower stage booster failed to land itself in this particular test. Plenty to be excited about across the board, though, when it comes to reusable rocketry. First up in the recent paleontology news, a new species of dinosaur has been named. This is a rather unusual new species due to the way in which it's been described, since the fossils of this animal were destroyed in World War II, and so all that's left of it are photographs and drawings. It comes from Egypt, and was originally unearthed by a man working for the legendary German paleontologist Ernst Stromer, famous for being the man who also described Spinosaurus. 
Stroma called this species Carcharodontosaurus saharicus, but during an Allied bombing raid on Munich, all of the fossils of this dinosaur were destroyed, along with the original Spinosaurus material. In 2007, a relatively complete skull found in Morocco was then named as the neotype of Carcharodontosaurus saharicus, so it replaced the lost bones and became the fossil that defines the characteristics of the species. Now though, paleontologists have discovered some previously unknown photos of the original destroyed Carcharodontosaurus fossils, and realised that they actually look very different to the neotype. As such, they've named it as a new species, Tameriraptor Mark Graffi. This therefore shows that the similarities in the dinosaur species present in both Egypt and Morocco might not be as strong as previously thought since it now seems that Carcharodontosaurus was not present in Egypt, as far as we know, and instead we only have Tamariraptor here, a large predator with a distinct nasal horn. A very interesting new study indeed. We've got a new species of prehistoric bird this week too. It's a kind of bird called an enantionothene, an entirely extinct lineage of birds that lived during the Cretaceous period. It comes from 124 to 120 million year old rocks in northwestern China, and has been named Novavis pubisculata. It's known from a partial skeleton that includes the legs, hip, and a few vertebrae. The paleontologists hypothesize that this specimen might actually represent a prehistoric regurgitated pellet, as the bones show a lot of fractures. So, this particular individual may have been eaten by a predator and then spat back out before becoming a fossil. Quite the journey. Novavis is also interesting as it's got an unusually short pubis, one of the hip bones. This is unlike any other known in Antiornithine, and would have impacted the attachment of the muscles in life since the pubis is an important anchor for tail muscles in living birds. The exact function of this shortened bone in this species is not known, but it does show that the wonderfully bizarre Antiornithine birds were even more diverse than we had realised. Also in the Paleo News, a fascinating study has used various lines of evidence to reconstruct the environments that the ancient human species Homo erectus was inhabiting, showing that these prehistoric relatives of ours were adapted to survive in extreme conditions. Homo erectus was a particularly successful species of ancient hominin that existed for almost two million years, and was the first human to expand out of Africa. Part of this success seems to have been down to their adaptability, as this study shows that Homo erectus was thriving in hyper-arid landscapes in Tanzania a million years ago. Evidence implies groups of Homo erectus adapted to the conditions by repeatedly returning to live in locations with fresh water availability and the development of specialised stone tools such as scrapers, therefore managing to survive in an otherwise very harsh climate. The study explains how Homo erectus had an ecological flexibility that previously was only attributed to more recent human species, and that this impressive flexibility likely allowed them to expand into the more arid parts of Africa and Eurasia, resulting in their wide distribution across the planet and longevity as a species. An important study that challenges assumptions about early hominin dispersal limits and expands on our knowledge of our incredible ancestors. In the archaeological news this week, research suggests women were at the centre of social networks in Iron Age Celtic communities in Britain. Analysis of 2,000-year-old DNA reveals evidence that married women stayed in their ancestral communities while the men came to live with them, which is known as a matrilocal society. This evidence suggests that Celtic societies may have given women higher status, an example which is found with the Durotrigues tribe, a tribe that occupied coastal central southern England around 2,000 to 900 years ago, where women were buried with valuable items. The authors analysed the genomes of 57 individuals buried in Iron Age cemeteries associated with the Durotrigues. They discovered most individuals were related through the maternal line, whereas unrelated individuals were predominantly male, assumed to have migrated after marriage to said maternal line. Such insights provide a deeper understanding of ancient British societies and add to the rich history of Celtic Britain. A fascinating study proposing a matrilocal pattern undescribed in European prehistory and shedding further light on women's prehistory, something that is often overlooked. 
Also in the news, what may be the world's oldest three-dimensional map has been discovered in a Paleolithic rock shelter in France. Since the 1980s, this rock shelter has been known for its artistic engravings. In 2017, researchers found that Paleolithic people had worked the sandstone in this cave in a way that mirrored a female form, and even opened channels for water that would outflow at the base of the pelvic triangle. This new research now suggests that part of the floor of the rock shelter was actually also shaped to reflect the surrounding landscape some 13,000 years ago. Research showed that the people sculpted the sandstone to promote specific flow paths for infiltrating and directing rainwater, something that has never before been recognised by archaeologists. These exceptional new findings, demonstrating the mental capacity, imagination and engineering capability of our ancestors, expand the known range of such 3D maps. Before this discovery, the oldest known 3D map was a large portable rock slab engraved 3,000 years ago in the Bronze Age. The two hydraulic depictions, the female anatomy and miniature landscape, are only a couple of metres from one another. The author suggests there is sure to be a more profound linking of the two with the meaning of life and nature, but unfortunately, we may never know. What a fantastic discovery. Hopefully, there will be more like it soon to come. Up next, scientists have published their discovery that injecting mice with a type of RNA molecule apparently reverses some of the effects of ageing. As we age, a greater number of our cells become senescent. Senescent cells are associated with a lot of the signs of ageing and various diseases that become more common as we get older. The particular molecule identified by scientists as helping to reverse some of these effects is a microRNA molecule that has a role in gene regulation. Researchers extracted these molecules from cultured human cells in a lab and then injected older mice with them. Amazingly, the mice that received more of these molecules were shown to survive on average for about four and a half months longer than the mice that didn't receive them. In addition, they regrew some of their hair, maintained a higher body weight, had improved strength for longer, had better balance and could navigate maze tests faster. More studies are needed to make sure that this molecule is definitely working in the way that's expected and to see how it might translate over to humans, but it's a very exciting discovery that could have a lot of potential. Finally, for the news this week, some updates on recent climate developments. Not only was 2024 the hottest year on record, passing the 1.5 degrees Celsius target set by the Paris Climate Agreement, but carbon emissions were also at a record high, scientists have announced. Between 2023 and 2024, carbon dioxide levels increased by nearly 3.6 parts per million. This is partly due to the El Niño event, which, because of the hot, dry conditions it brings, limits the growth of plants that remove some carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. However, even without the El Niño effect, carbon dioxide levels would still have been higher due to human activities, namely the burning of fossil fuels and deforestation, but also because of wildfires. Wildfires blazing around the world in 2024 added an estimated 7 gigatons of carbon dioxide over the first 10 months of the year. Since 2021, carbon dioxide emissions from forest fires have surged 60% globally and almost tripled in some of the most climate-sensitive boreal forests. The natural world has been able to absorb roughly half of the man-made carbon dioxide emissions through extra plant growth and more of the gas being dissolved in the ocean. But this extra increase raises concerns that the biosphere is becoming less able to absorb planet warming gases for the long term. For example, the ability of the Amazon rainforest to absorb carbon dioxide is being impaired due to drought, wildfires and deforestation. The Met Office prediction for 2025 is a rise of a smaller amount, just 2.3 parts per million, as El Niño's opposite phase, La Niña, encourages more vegetation growth. However, overall, it is still an ongoing rising trend. Well, that's it from us this week. Thanks for watching and a special thank you to our patrons as well, including Corey Peterson, Andrew Karam, Giotist, Clara Middleton, Dravshree Vastava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Lena Rose, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Ralph Balzac, Robert Thomas, Sammy Voss, Staniforth Hopkins, Timothy N. Tedro, and Troy Schmidt. Thank you for helping make our videos possible. I do hope you all enjoyed Seven Days of Science, and as always, we'll see you on Sunday.